and then it was like at the end of the night I realized I didn't think about having a drink like at all since this happened and I didn't crave it. And I went, eh, well, I'm not drinking at night. And I remember it was real quick thought and I went to bed, whatever. And we went on with our day and um, it was about the next day, I think, that I remember at one point I, I realized, I acknowledged the fact that my brain did not once um, crave or think to solve any problem of mine by getting a drink. And what I mean by that is basically it just, it was like, it, it was like it didn't, alcohol was no longer a solution in my life. It was no longer a, uh, existent. And I remember thinking about that. I'm like, wait a second. And I'm delivered from alcohol. I think he finally answered me. And, um, I felt amazing. And I, I felt like the, the, there was this dark piece of something in my soul or a piece missing, if you will. And it just got filled back up. So I no longer needed to fill that with alcohol or something. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was when he prayed or when she had a word of knowledge over me and prayed over me at a distance telling me about stuff. Like, I don't know what it was. All I know is that day, literally, I was free. Like, I know this sounds dramatic and people might not even believe this, but, I, you know, oh, that ain't, no, that's just weird. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I, I have many witnesses in my life including Cheyenne and my parents and my sister and so many people that knew the amount of anger and me drinking, seeing all the bottles and stuff I'd bag up and literally, and I have not touched not one little tiny drop of alcohol since that day. Nothing. So I've tried to do this video probably a hundred and something times in the past year and some change. Um, so I'm going to finally try to just make this the last one. Please, God, <laughs> let this be the last time. So hopefully I can get this in 30 or 40 minutes, hopefully less if I can. But there's so much in this story that's so important that I want people to really, really understand and grasp the journey to what God did for me. <clears throat> so this is a testimony. Basically, it's about, I used to be an alcoholic and um, God freed me from that addiction. Um, he delivered me from the addiction. And basically that's what delivered means. He's like, you know. So <clears throat> I'm going to start back when I was a kid. So when I was a kid, um, my mom took us to church. There was my sister and me. My sister's a few years older and uh, she took us to church. <clears throat> I didn't really have a full understanding to who Jesus was. Sorry, I drank some orange juice and I'm feeling a little phlegmy. <sighs> so anyway, um, I didn't really have a full understanding of who Jesus really was. I knew he like died on the cross, you know, fed a thousand or five thousand with a, with a fish and some bread and stuff like that. I knew those, those stories. Um, I experienced his presence a few times when I was a kid, you know, a miracle or two, but I uh, never really had a full understanding. And when I was about, I made it to about 11 or 12, um, I used to just go to Sunday school and like hear the stories and hear people talk about it and answer some questions I had, but never listen to the preacher because when I was a kid, that part was boring to me. So I never really paid attention. And most of the times I was in Sunday school and, uh, if I ever stayed up to listen to the preaching, I wasn't really paying attention. So I didn't really learn everything there was to know. When I, and when I hit 11 or 12, my mom gave me the opportunity to go if I wanted to or not. That's an age of rebellion, uh, puberty, all that stuff. And, you know, she t saw change behavior in me and my sister and stuff and didn't want to force us. Um... Some people might not agree with that, but like, you know, it's probably a good thing because I did come back uh, to God and I'm going to get into that. But so I chose not to go. And then I hit about 14 years old and uh, I my sister didn't really go either. She still believed in God, too. We both believed in Jesus and all that stuff. But um, when I hit like 14, I started smoking weed. Uh, I tried alcohol. Um, hit 15, then 16, I started smoking cigarettes, uh, drinking when I could, smoking weed when I could. You know, I tried a few other small drugs or whatever. 
And then um, I started getting into fights in school a lot more. Uh, well, I got into more fights, I think, in elementary and middle school. But in high school, I'd get into fights in and out of school, kind of. Never anything like, um, you know, like, I don't know. Anyway, um, <clears throat> a lot of those uh, fights, by the way, were arguments. Some fist fights outside of school. And when I hit high school, it kind of stopped. I only got into, a, like, a few outside of school or whatever. But anyway, when I was like, um... Let's see here. I was like 18. When I turned 18, I was still doing this. You know, I, I've, I've been smoking, drinking, doing this, that, uh, smoking weed and, uh, you know, dating, uh, sleeping around, um, swearing, listening to some crazy evil music, um, skipping school all the time, yelling at people and just being mad and uh, <clears throat> didn't really want anything to do with high school anymore. There's a lot going on with friends and ex-girlfriends of mine and some a whole bunch of high school drama. A lot of it was like fake and, and false rumors of things. And people had, you know, a lot of people had the wrong idea about who I was. So I didn't feel like going to, to school much. So I, I skipped a lot and kind of just dealt with my anger outside and whatever. When I hit 18, around eight, 17 or 18, I stopped smoking weed because it messed with my mind so much. Um, I decided to stop, but I started drinking, whatever. And then I got like all my friends kind of graduated and, uh, I skipped so much that I failed quite a few classes. I had to stay and instead of quitting, I chose to stay and just man up and get my regions diploma. And I did. And, uh, I dealt with that humility, which was hard, but I did. And then, um, I got out of high school and didn't know where to go. I uh, stopped hanging out with people and I'm still living at my parents. I had a Jeep that I had, but I needed to get back on the road because I didn't have a job. So I got a job. I started working all the time, um, gaining money. I got my Jeep back on the road and I'm doing this job that I don't like doing, but I did it anyway to get money, trying to figure out who I was. So being alone, starting a new job, I got new friends. They were not really good friends. We all drank a lot, which doesn't mean they're not good friends, but like I'm getting there. <clears throat> and, you know, messing around, some of these people had anger issues too. They'd get drunk and we'll fight. We'd all come close to getting arrested. There was a lot of drinking and driving and all these other things. And um, I ended up taking over. My uncle had this small little local uh, moving business where we'd load and unload U-Haul trucks for people and stuff. I took that over and it became mine pretty much. It wasn't anything crazy, but it, uh, I ended up uh, building it up, advertising it and making good money. And then I still had my other job, hanging out with these friends. I got this one relationship, uh, not the same one I'm in now. Um, this is an ex way in the past, but you know, I was like 21, I'm 27 now. So anyway, then around 22, I think, these friends of mine, we'd hang out and they started introducing me to painkillers. And at first I wasn't like big on it, but I tried them, you know, we were drinking, I'd try them and try them. And then one day I had, I think so much and it hit me and I liked that feeling and it took away any anger or anxiety or anything that I was thinking about being stressed out about my relationship at the time or anything. It took that away and helped me. I f thought it was helping me. It was a temporary fix. Um, and then it got to the point where I did those painkillers and I stopped drinking and I used to drink quite often at nighttime, you know, I always had fun. I was never an abusive alcoholic or nothing. Um, but anyway, I'd just kind of loosen up and be funny and stupid and whatever. And, um, I do it quite often, especially when I turned 21, cause then I could get it on my own. And, but it was on and off. Like I would drink like every night for like a month and then there would be times where I didn't and didn't care to drink. Uh, so I battled with that a little bit, but it wasn't too crazy. And then I got into these pills and what I didn't know then is what I know now is those like painkillers, man, they warn you. Like they are addictive and it doesn't matter what background you have. My parents weren't alcoholics. They didn't do any drugs. They didn't even smoke weed, like nothing. Like, they didn't beat, beat us or nothing. Uh, an occasional spanking that I probably deserved because I was crazy, but, like, <laughs> nothing, like, crazy. I didn't, I wasn't really traumatized. I mean, you know, my dad 
struggled growing or when we were growing up and worked a lot and uh you know we didn't there were some things that i i couldn't have like my friends growing up and um you know they'd give me crap for that like oh you don't we all have four wheelers and you don't have nothing stuff like that and i'm like yeah real friends but anyway uh where was i at so oh yeah i started doing these painkillers and i i don't know where it came from but like all you have to do is take some sort of a strong drug like that every day for like two or three weeks and you can get addicted to it like physically and mentally emotionally all that stuff and uh oh it would be it was a party thing and you know and there was some times where i m misused them like instead of popping them you know crushing them up and and putting them in my nose basically i'm gonna say so sorry if that's too much but this is the truth this is what i dealt with so um, for those of you who don't know the effects of that, uh, painkillers have a very big, strong supply of endorphins and serotonin and dopamine, all that stuff. Um, I could be a little bit wrong here, but this is what I researched a long time ago. Basically, your body produces a certain amount of dopamine that comes from laughter, chocolate, cigarettes, uh, certain drinks or sugar, you know, stuff that makes you feel that little light, oh, you know? And then uh, endorphins is your body's natural painkiller. So like after exercise or when you sleep or whatever, it releases those things. Serotonin, I believe, was the one that helps you sleep. So me with a racing mind for a lot of my life already had trouble sleeping or getting to sleep. But uh, so I started to do these things more often. And when I did them more often, I started developing minor withdrawals. Like I'd get irritable. I'd have cravings. So I started to do, you know, get some painkillers during the day. And just for a few weeks to, I'd say like a month, um, I woke up one day. I stopped drinking, by the way, because they just didn't mix. And I'd throw up a lot if I had both of them. So I just kind of moved to the painkillers because they were stronger and, you know. And uh, um, let's see here. So I gave my body so much of it. One day I woke up and had full blast withdrawals. It's like the flu jumped on me and started beating the ever-living crap out of me with all of the flu-strain buddies, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I couldn't hold anything down. I'd throw up. Your body, your bowels are, like, shocked. So I was in the bathroom, like, every five minutes. My legs and my back from moving people, now my body's not producing endorphins because I give it so much it doesn't need to produce these things. So now my body is in pain. It's in horrible pain. For, and I figured it was from all the moving that I was doing. And I'm like, what is going on? I could barely sit down. It felt like I ripped every muscle in my leg and my back. It was horrible. I was like uh, almost in tears. And like, um, uh, you're either way too hot or too cold. You can't pick one. You, 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 like you have to pick one and that's it. It's horrible. It feels like bugs are crawling under your skin. Like... Um, you're irritated, you're depressed, you feel horrible and guilt and shame of where you just, where you are in life, you know, and it was horrible. And, uh, so I had to get them to be able to work because there were some moving jobs I did where I had to have withdrawals in 80 something, 90 degree weather, sweating, puking, pooping and stuff, asking to use their bathroom every five minutes, like, and I was in so much pain, but I still had to do those moving jobs because I, you know, I'm responsible for this. So at one point, you know, now my friends and I are all kind of getting irritated with each other because of this and weird. They're trying to steal stuff and I wasn't a thief, so I couldn't really do that, you know. So I was like, I had to work for my money to get any pill that I could and it was pretty embarrassing. This happened for a few months, you know, and uh, I, I started searching up like, I have to get out of this, man. I'm out on my own, living in my own apartment. I have a decent car at the time. It was a SUV, a Jeep. And I had a moving business. I had another job. I had a girlfriend at the time that was not working out. We were so on and off and mad at each other. It was crazy. And um, so I'm building up and I felt like I was doing pretty good in life, you know. And then all this stuff started happening. The friends that I had helping me out in moving jobs couldn't. One tried stealing from a moving job that I had. He tried to put stuff in his car so he could sell it to get drugs or whatever. And I, I didn't have anybody else to help me because the jobs were so on and off and on call. Other people had full-time steady jobs that would help me out. And so I'm like, so I was late to jobs or sometimes they'd hire three guys. I'd only show up with two because 
I couldn't find a third person out of 20 or 30 people I know to help oh, couldn't help me. And me not doing the best that I could do because I was dope sick is what you would call it, you know, um, sometimes it started to put that business in the hole. I was gaining a lot of five star reviews, a lot of people like some work that I couldn't even handle. And uh, I learned a lot from that. So anyway, so I figured out how do I get rid of this? Um, I didn't have any money. I had to like try to figure out if I could move out of my apartment and move back into my parents. Right. And right at, right at the same point, I'm like, I got to get rid of these pills. It's already been a few months using these things. I got to. So I searched up everything that I could to figure out how to wean off of these things properly without having to go to rehab without whatever. And I did, I was able to do it successfully and, um, stay away from them, cut off a lot of my friends. Um, and at the same time, this happened. I had to move back in with my parents. Now I'm like, I got so much bad news for in like one week that the people that I had the moving, moving website on froze my account because something was up. They're like, you relate to this job, this job, like this happened. We want to know what's going on, whatever. And I'm like, I don't even have time for you. I have so much other things going on. So that froze. So I told everybody, well, moving's out. Um, so we can't do that. Then I lost my other job. So now I'm like, yeah, I can't pay, pay the rent. I have to move, go back to my parents. So I cut off everybody I know pretty much didn't hang out with any of them anymore. Went back to my parents. I cut off that relationship I was in that just was not working out, man. We just were not doing good. We were on and off. I don't even think like we weren't even in a relationship by the end. It was like the last year, whatever we were just barely talked. We were always mad at each other, hung out once in a while. Like it was crazy. So I was like, F this. Excuse my language, even though I didn't say it. But anyway, screw this. I'm uh, I'm not doing this. So now I have no relationship. I'm alone again. I have like I cut off everybody I know. They're trying to get a hold of me. I wouldn't even talk to them because of how many bad experiences I've had and the point of life I'm in. It was my fault, but like you know, for for doing what I did. But they were not helping me improve. They were just kind of pulling me down. And uh, I had to move back in with my parents throw a bunch of my stuff out because I didn't have room for all of it. And uh, I'm like 22 at the time, or 23. Yeah, 23, and I moved back in with my parents. So now I'm like, okay, all I have left now is my car, and I need to find a job, and I have nobody that I can really talk to other than family, you know? And uh, then, a day or two later, my Jeep... I didn't know the ball joint was really, really loose. I hit a bump. My whole tire came out. My front end came out. I lost it. I started screaming, punching the steering wheel. This guy came up to help, and I'm like losing my crap. At the, He's like, oh, no, never mind. He's mad. Sorry, man. And I'm like, no, sorry, and I felt bad for that. And Now I'm like, I'm, I'm so messed up in the head. My body was still trying to fully recover. My, I was so depressed also with all these things coming at me i lost like everything everything relationships money my apartment my car now i had nothing literally my body's trying to repair itself and i'm like what the heck did i do to myself i was so upset um god bless my dad a couple weeks later he helped me get a, a kind of a cheap truck i'm not crapping on it it was it was decent and uh enough to get me by for a while but um he helped me get one so I could have a ride to work. End up getting a new job, making $50 a night, literally under the table, 50 bucks every night for like five or six hours, making nothing. I used to, you know, and I only worked a few days a week, 150 to 200 bucks a week if I was lucky. And I used to make that much in like a cut, like three or four hours. Uh, so I'm like, I was kind of tight about that. And, uh, um, thank God I still had a lot of repeating customers that called me up personally, like, Hey, you still do moving? And I'm like, sure. And you know, so I still to this day, every now and then get a moving job, but I have new work. But anyway, at the time, um, I had a truck. I'm at this crappy paying job as a dishwasher, no offense, but against dishwashers, but from where I was at starting back as a dishwasher kind of sucked. So my friend asked me one time, this other, this one girl, I uh, was like, oh, can you give my friends and I a ride uh, to the bar? If we don't have a ride, I'll give you some gas money. I said, sure. Uh, I take her out. She's like, you want to come in? I'll get you a drink. 
I'm like, no, I don't do anything really anymore. I'm kind of trying to stay away from that. And I don't think I can stomach a drink, whatever. But at one point I was like, you know what? I'll come inside and just chill, whatever. And people are around. I smell booze. I'm like, people are dancing. For some reason I had anxiety. I never get anxiety from, from being in that, like, I never really got anxiety or any bad feelings from being around people. But for some reason my body and mind was messed up. So, um, I, I was like, yeah, you know what? I'll take that drink. I'll just have a beer. Grabbed a beer. I hadn't had a beer in months, but like, you know, cause I was just doing pills, but I chugged the beer. It gave me a little buzz and I, I automatically remembered right then. I remember what drinking feels like and all those, all that anxiety or that weird feeling, the depression I had started to fall and I felt good. And I was like, yeah, drinking never gave me withdrawals. Why don't I just go back to drinking? So ever since that night, I, every single night that I came home from work, I would drink. I got booze every night, every night, every night. Literally. A couple months later, I'm building some money up, getting back on my feet, but I'm drinking every night. And uh, I ended up meeting my now wife, which is definitely um, God sent. I feel like God put on her on this planet for me and vice versa. We're literally like meant to be together <laughs> i know that sounds cheesy but trust me you don't even know she's like, like she's like the only one i really fit fit with um 100 so anyway it was definitely god looking out for me when i didn't even realize it and uh we started dating and um let's see here a couple months in i mean i i was drinking quite often uh pretty much every night and she didn't know about it at first but she didn't know I drank and we got along she knew I wasn't an uh, abusive alcoholic or nothing I wasn't bad or nothing so sometimes she drank with me you know and we were I was 23 and then, then I turned 24 when we started dating and she was 23 so we're young and you know there was no problems with me drinking so she didn't mind it I was always kind of fun and I never had too much like to where I was like really puking that happened once in a blue moon but Anyway, uh, she eventually ended up finding out that it was every night and was concerned because of things in her past, but she was like, you know, trying to be there for me. And she didn't give me any crap for it or nothing, but she was, you know, we talked about it a few times. I felt bad. So we build our relationship up. We build up money and stuff like that. Uh, we end up moving out together. I left my parents and whatever. Now we get pregnant and we get married and our kids on the way and I'm like oh great I'm still drinking so <clears throat> right around the time though that we moved out my sister started going back to church then my dad who I never even saw I think he stepped foot in church once to see us do a Christmas play or something never thought he'd go back to church ever and he went back to church he started changing he started acting different in a good way and so did my sister. My mom is still being who she was. Good relationship with God. Prays a lot. Reads the Bible. Listens to preachings and teachings. Respects and fears the Lord like a good Christian. She did not push me. She didn't rub anything in my face or try to get me to go or nothing. She would just be patient. And, and the funny thing was is out of all of them, I'd go to her if I had questions or wanted to talk about stuff. Because I knew she wouldn't push, push me. And um, my sister and my dad, I don't think they meant to, but they came across like, hey, you should go back to church. And like I said, I had a misunderstanding. So at first I'm like, listen, okay, I believe in God. Okay, I haven't murdered nobody. I haven't raped nobody. I haven't robbed a bank. Okay, I'm okay. <laughs> I don't sell drugs. It's like I'm not doing anything horrible, you know, but I had a misunderstanding. I thought I could make it maybe because I believed in God, you know. We all have that thought. Eh, I believe in them. I'll try to be a good person to the best of my knowledge. Well, it doesn't work that way. But anyway, at the time, I thought it was possible. So one day, my sister gets me to go out to church. I finally go out. I'm like, all right, sure. You know, my wife and I go. I'm still drinking at this point, by the way. And there was a lot of things I was struggling with and questioning. And when I stepped foot into that church for the first time in my life, I actually listened to a sermon. This pastor was um preaching like i've never heard and it 
really sounded like and felt like he was talking to me 100%, everything. And it wasn't just like, oh, you're a sinner, and you feel far away from God, don't you, because you sin, so that's why you need Jesus. It wasn't something like that. We could all agree with that, because we all sin. This was more in depth and deep, and there were certain subjects and places and lines that he used. Like, he knew my thoughts. He knew what I was, like, literally, it was bad. And I thought my sister put him up to it. I was like, you've been trying to get me to come here, and you probably were like, I could picture it in my head. I'm like, you probably went to him, listen, my brother's coming this weekend. He struggles with this, 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 and this. Can you preach on that, please? And try to like touch him or whatever. That's what I thought happened. But it that didn't happen at all. <laughs> um, so I was like, you put him up to it. And then I started figuring out like the Holy Spirit, man. Uh, that pastor's Holy Spirit, like Holy Ghost filled, man. So he's like, he knew what he was doing. The Holy Spirit knew what he was doing. And I was meant to be there that day. So ever since that day, it messed with me even more. I started, you know, feeling different about things. And then an evangelist came. Um, he started preaching. And uh, I remember he really got me even harder to the point where I was bawling. And when they did the altar call, I went up there and was like, I need Jesus. And it was bad. I was like, he's like, if you feel like that's you. I want to pray for you. Come up here. And I was like, I'm going up. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> it was so bad. Like, people were looking at me. I'm bawling. I'm like, trying to hide it. <clears throat> so, I walk out of that place. And like like I said, I'm struggling with drinking, by the way. So, I start praying about it. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't drink anymore. And this was right before Cheyenne got pregnant. Then she gets pregnant. And I'm really like, oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait. And I'm learning all these things about being a parent. And I'm like, tr try to get ahead. And I started really thinking about how I turned out. And I'm like, well, my parents never drank or did drugs or nothing. Never beat us. And I turned out okay. But then I was like, but did I? There's a lot of things that I did that a lot of people don't do. I mean, there's also a lot of things that people do that I haven't done. And whatever. But I didn't want to drink at all when my son got around. Like, I was like, I need to quit. But it, for some reason, that, no matter how much I thought about that, do it for my kid, do it for my kid. I couldn't stop drinking. Um, every time I tried to stop, it's like when you try to put up your phone. Anybody now knows this. I'm not going to get on my phone for a week. Yeah, you're going to think about it every day and you're going to cave. Chances are. <laughs> See what I'm saying? It was like that times 10. I, I would think about drinking almost every second of the day. I know that's sad, but that's how bad the addiction was. And remember, those pills really messed me up. So when I came back to drinking and found something that fixed all that shame, that drinking is what I went to. So the pill addiction was gone. It was like that never existed, but it was always like something needed to be filled. So I never got any more cravings for a pill, but I get cravings for alcohol every damn day. And I'd stop to, I'd try to stop, uh, drinking for like maybe a week i can make it sometimes three or four weeks like about a month if i was lucky but every single day of that month was like i remembered like every second of every day it was like i was paying attention to time so much that it was the longest couple weeks of my life and every day i battled with everything in me to stay away from alcohol wouldn't happen I'd end up coming back and finding some excuse. Eh, well, it's been a, it's been two weeks. Let's celebrate with a drink. My liver even acted up, and my stomach. I had to go get seen and get like uh, ultrasound, and like they had to, you know, put a tube in me to check things out because uh, things were happening. And my liver enzymes were really high, and I was like, oh man, I can't be drinking, and it scared me. So I, I, I stayed away from it, but I still craved it all the time. And I was like, stay away from it. Don't kill yourself. You're gonna hurt your liver and never you're gonna regret it you know what i mean so i was like just stay away from it but i still had to fight it but then the news came back that my liver was okay everything was fine so i was like oh yeah see let's celebrate with a drink i'm only 25 at the time <laughs> you know why not have a drink so uh and then you know i turned 26 um i was 26 when my son was born yeah so Let's get through this. Uh, 
So I struggled with this battle, battle, just battling, trying to, you know, get away from drinking, but I always came back. And then I'd drink every night for months, and then I'd stop for a week. I'm, I'm really going to focus. I'm going to start working out. I'm going to stay away from drinking. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get it done. <laughs> nope. I ended up coming back, and a week later, my mind would change. Ah, screw it. Get a drink. And um, I started to struggle with this on and off, like this battle of good and evil. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going back to church now, on and off, but I'm going back. I'm asking questions. Then I start, my, my wife's belly starts poking out. I'm like, oh, he's, he's on his way, man. My son is on his way. And I'm like, I can't be drinking. I don't want this. And I, I'm like crying about it every now and then and praying about it. Then I start asking, what if I just sucked up my pride and asked for people to pray for me? So I started going up to the pastors and people in this church. I started going to their Ithaca campus because they have more than one church because it was closer. And uh, I talked to that pastor. He tries helping me out. And, you know, he prayed over me. Other people had prayed over me, family, nothing. I kept drinking. And I'd feel really good. And I would pray and, and about it and ask and beg God to take it away. And I still drank. I still had cravings. I could not get it off of me. It was like a... A leech or something just stuck to my soul. It was horrible. So um, I go to the pastor. Now I'm getting frustrated. And I'm like, I've always believed in God, okay? I'm back at church. I definitely remember this feeling of being in church. But I was like, but for some reason, God's not answering this prayer. And I was like, doesn't he not want me to drink? In, in the Bible, there's plenty of areas where, it, where the, you know, it shows drinking is a sin. Being an alcoholic is a sin, you know? I'm like... He wants us to have a sober mind, and people say, well, Jesus drank wine. That was different. He wasn't a drunk. You can, you know, have a glass of wine, and once in a while, it's not a sin, but it's like, you know, getting drunk, that's what I was doing. And, and I also had an addiction, which is a sin, being, being you know, I'm like serving a evil spirit. What do you, why do you think they call it? Wines and spirits. It's like, duh. So anyway, um, so... I'm like, but he's not answering my prayer. And I go to the pastor and I tell him how much I'm trying to quit. And he was like, Why? you're trying to do too much of this by yourself. Why don't you let God um, take the wheel, you know? And I'm sitting here like, what? What are you even saying? Like, he can't control us, right? So how's he just going to make me perfect? So I was like, he wouldn't do that because if he could, sure, make me perfect. Then I'll never sin again, right? And he's like, no, 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 you're not, you know? I can't remember the whole conversation. I'm trying to be as accurate as I could, but I was like, I don't know what you mean, but he's like surrendering, you know, it, it, being humble about it and all this stuff and having him help you. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like, well, I've been asking him to take it away. So, you know, and then my mom, she, I go to her, she's saying the same stuff. And she's like, just be humble before the Lord and uh, have him help you and, or surrender to him. And I'm like, what do you mean? I put my hands up, you know, God, please, I'm surrendering. That's surrendering. See what I'm saying, right? I'm asking his, for his help. That's surrendering. She's like, admit you can't do it without him. Just be humble about it, you know? I'm like, oh my gosh, all right. I keep drinking. And then uh, one day, finally, you know, I'm in and out of church, whatever, but kind of starting to give up a little bit now at this point. It comes close to this day, right? And it's like October. My son's like almost probably, he's, you know, a few months and he's going to be born. And uh, the end of October, I take Cheyenne to work one day. I come back home, walked into my room, and it was dark and whatever, and I just broke, broke, and fell on the bed and started crying. And um, I'm like, God, like, I can't remember how I did it, but I pretty much just, just weeping and asking him, begging him to take this addiction off of my life. And out of my body, like, because I can't do it. I've tried everything. I've, the scare tactics of going to hell didn't work. My son coming to this earth, that didn't work. Nothing pushed me hard enough, but I wanted it gone so bad. I'm like, how come I want it to go away? But I still drink. It was because those feelings of not being able to get rid of it would make me, well, you know what? If I drink, I'll feel better about this. <laughs> It's like that's pretty much what it was. So I break, and um, I cried it out and begged them, and, and, you know, it's in your hands, you know, sort of thing. And I became very humble before the Lord. And, you know, 
finished my prayer, went on with my day, and that same night, I'm pretty sure, I didn't get an answer, so I drank. The next night, I drank. A couple days go by, and I'm like, this ain't working. I'm not even, I don't even think God is real anymore. So I started, like, the devil was messing with my mind, too, because I started to dig so deep into how church works and how the Bible is and all these things that I could find a fault with. But at the same time, there was always somebody that could somehow, or a thought that I had that could somehow counteract it to make it even more of a struggle. And there's just no way I could really logically say that God didn't exist. It just, it doesn't make sense that he doesn't exist. People think that it does. They say they think that it does, but it doesn't. If you really think about it, there has to be a God. There's just no way. And I, I'm going to do a different video, by the way, on that. I have some good stuff that y'all need to hear. Trust me. <laughs> but anyway, because my mind is, just, I'm a thinker, man. So anyway, let's stay in the subject. Scott, come on, let's do it. So anyway, I'm going back to this church. Um, nothing's happening. I break, whatever. Now I'm giving up. I'm believing God might not even exist, but I know it's not true, but I'm trying to make it true because I think it was just because I really didn't want to go to hell and I knew I was messing up so bad with alcohol and some, a couple other things that, you know, there was just no hope for me. And, uh, I felt like maybe God does exist, but he's so mad at me. He doesn't want to answer my prayer or something. I don't know. And, um, so I, I said, screw it. And then this November 2nd was a Saturday. That hit, I drank, and I drank pretty hard. And for the first time, in, or whatever, one of the first times that I've ever done this, I used to drink like 99 proof shots straight. I'd get, I could get like 10 to 12 of them um, in a day and not throw up. Like literally, 99 proof shots straight. And uh, my tolerance went up that high. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that's how bad it was. It was disgusting. And... Uh, Dada, I'm in here, Bob. <laughs> He's got to go to bed soon. He's probably fussy. So anyway, <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? Ah, oh, dang it. Oh, yeah. So I dropped Cheyenne. Uh, I, I drank that night, and I said some things that I normally wouldn't say, and I think it was like literally like the devil. Like I, I know it sounds crazy. Y'all are probably like, oh, my gosh, Scott, what are you saying? But like I'm telling you. I said some things, like that night when I drank, that Saturday, I said some things that I would never say. Um, I think it was that Saturday. It might have been the night before. I can't remember. But I remember it freaked me out. And Cheyenne was like, you said some creepy stuff last night. And I was like, I know. I remember. But I was like, that wasn't me. Like, I, I wouldn't say that. It was creepy. It was like, it was creepy. I don't know how to explain it. So it freaked me out. But, you know, I still drank and still thought that I would drink and whatever. So I drop her off at work the next morning on a Sunday. This was November 3rd, 2019. I'm feeling kind of icky, you know, and tired. I feel like I'm going to drop her off and then I'm going to go home and go back to sleep. And normally I would try to go to church, but I kind of gave up on it at this point. You know, I'm like, God's not real. And if he is, he's not listening to me and he's not answering me. So whatever, there's no use. And I'm going to be an alcoholic or I'm going to try to fight the addiction off for the rest of my life. Because no matter if I don't drink, I'm fighting it. If I do drink, then I feel it just, this sucked. And then uh, I'm going to head back to my house. It's like 11 o'clock. So church is starting. And at the time, I was going to the Horseheads campus. For Mythica, that's like 35, 40 minutes, depending on where you are. Maybe 25. So it was about 35 minutes from where I was. And uh, my sister texted me. And I was just about to leave Cheyenne's work and just go back home. She's like, are you coming to church? And I was like, I don't think so. I'm kind of giving up. And she's like, no, 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 you got to come out just one last time. This evangelist is here. I never heard of him. And uh, she gave me his name. And I'm like, wow, okay. And, he, you know, she's like, wow, he's so he's so good. You have to come. And I'm like, well, it sounds good. I kind of, like, had my hopes up. Like, maybe this guy could help me. Maybe. And, you know, I was like, but I'm going to be so late. I'm not even going to be able to, you know, church already started. Worship starts and goes to, like, 1130. And then they start preaching. I'm not going to be there till like, 1145 or something. She's like, no, 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 no. He preached so much the first service, like the second service, you know, is going to start later. So I'm like, all right, I guess I'll come out. So I'm on my way. I'm mad and I'm thinking a lot, just silent in the car the entire way by myself. I started praying, you know, asking God to just reveal himself to me somehow. Even if he didn't get me out of this alcohol, just do something for me to help me understand 
you know, or to, or to make me feel better, something. And, and then I started venting about how I felt. Like, I, I felt like I was really small. I felt like he might have forgot about me or something. Like, I don't know all these things, and I didn't know what my purpose was on this planet. And uh, I was happy with Cheyenne, and, and it had nothing to do with her. Um, I was so excited to have a kid, I couldn't even stand it. I couldn't wait for him to be born. But at the same time, I could because I wanted this alcohol to go away. So I'm like, why do I want it gone so bad? But it's still hanging on to me. And then um, <clears throat> I'm praying about all this stuff, and I started crying a little bit. I'm like, get yourself together. I've been crying more in my life than ever since I started going back to church. You know, I haven't cried like that since I don't even know <laughs> that many times. I go out to the church, and I thought I was going to be late, but I walked in, and it was late. Every, you know, like every, it, everything kind of went into later timing, so everyone was sitting down when I got there. I just missed worship. Like the worship, they were all sitting, all right, take your seats, and introducing this evangelist. So I just sat down, right? So I'm like, whew, I'm on time. Just made it. And I'm listening. You know, I ended up finding my sister. We sat together, and this dude's preaching, and he's he's hitting it. He's preaching really good, man. And uh, he opened up my mind, still to this day, to a totally different perspective of how to read the Bible and how to see the stories and how to really learn, like, all, all this stuff. And I'm like, wow, maybe that's why I'm here, to get a different perspective, and you know, because I did pray, like, give me something, so maybe that's it. But I still felt kind of down, like I'm I'm gonna be drinking later today probably. So, but you know, this kind of helped, and uh, we are, we all kind of stood up at the end of it. And his wife grabbed the microphone, uh, and you know she's in ministry too, and she started having like calling some people out. She had a word of knowledge over him, which basically is like God speaking to somebody, giving them information to tell somebody that they wouldn't know. It's like if I were to just come up to somebody and say, God told me something, and, and then I'd go over to them and be like, hey, is your name whatever? They're like, yeah. How'd you know that? And you're like, I, I don't know. And then are you struggling with something, like your shoulder's out of place or something? They're like, yeah, it's killing me. It hurts like a son of a gun. And you're like, well, God told me to, uh, God told me about it, so can I pray over you and heal it, whatever? And then they pray, and then it gets healed. Like Stuff like that happens. That's a healing and a word of knowledge or whatever. So the word of knowledge, she had something like that. It wasn't like a healing for me, but it was a, a word of knowledge. And um, she called them out, and I'm like, wow, that's really amazing. They got a word of knowledge. And then she's like, who's this gentleman back here in the red and the black? And this was a big church. So I was like, me? She can't be talking to me. She's like, yeah, you, what's your name? So I told her. She starts telling me all this stuff. And the first thing she says was, I don't know if you were going to be late or if you were going to miss today or what was going to happen. And I'm like, how the, how the heck does she know that? I was on time. My sister doesn't even know who she is. She wouldn't even have the chance to talk to her. And I'm like, nobody really knows me at this church at all. They, you know, How did anybody, like, how did she know that? And my sister had left, by the way. That, that's why I couldn't find her. She ended up coming in. She's like, sorry, I had to go down and leave for because I she left the first service, whatever. And um, I'm like, wow, so that caught my attention. Then she starts telling me all these things, some things that I prayed about by myself. So I knew there was no way anybody could have given her that information. There's just no way. And it wasn't just something like, I see you're struggling, or God told me you're struggling. It wasn't like that. We all struggle. So I'd be like, anybody could tell you that. <laughs> but like this was deeper. This was like, she, she even said some things that I had literally said out loud by myself. And um, there was a lot to it. She said a whole bunch. I don't want to get into it. Um, but uh, it... It start, I started crying, and uh, people were looking at me, so I kind of like hid a little bit, and I missed some of what she said. I couldn't hear all of it, but anyway, oh, I cleared up, and uh, he grabbed the microphone back and was like, wow, thank you, Jesus, and was like, he was preaching on storms. There's a, a story in the Bible where Jesus was sleeping in the boat, and they went through this huge storm, and the disciples woke him up and whatever, and he... He... <laughs> he he, uh, um, she's probably trying to put him to sleep. So anyway, uh, he was like, who in here has storms? Storms are going through. And I'm like, I have storms. <laughs> Me, I have storms. And I have big storms. <laughs> and he's like, I want to pray for you. And just prayed for everybody. And then at the end, I'm like, wow, I cleared up. Uh, uh. I went up. They were offering to pray for people, lay hands on people. So I went up. I talked to him. 
such a nice guy, such a really powerful man of God. I love that guy, man. And he, he talked to me and was so cool, and he laid hands on me and prayed for me. He got a little into it, like, I rebuke it in Jesus' name sort of thing. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. But uh, I didn't really feel, I don't know. I left there, everybody's like coming up to me. Hey, that was a really powerful word that she spoke over you. And I'm like, thanks. Somebody else did the same. I'm like, what do you mean? Like people are acting like I'm the chosen one. I told that to my sister. She's like, did you not hear what she said? And I'm like, I heard some of it, but not all of it. So they were like, go, go back on. They recorded it live on like their Facebook feed. Like go back and watch that. Listen to what she said. So I did. And it was even more powerful. I left there. I felt great, you know, and I felt um, like my spirit was cleansed in a way, like, or, or something. And I, I didn't really think about all my problems in that moment. I thought about what just happened and, uh, really good. I felt like I was, I was improving, getting answers and stuff. And I go and I pick up Cheyenne and I'm telling her all about it. We go home. And then it was like, at the end of the night, I realized I didn't think about having a drink like at all since this happened and I didn't crave it. And I went, eh, well, I'm not drinking at night. And I remember it was a real quick thought and I went to bed, whatever. And we went on with our day and, um, it was about the next day. I think that I remember at one point I, I realized, I acknowledged the fact that my brain did not once, um, crave or think to solve any problem of mine by getting a drink. And what I mean by that is basically it just, it was like, it, it was like it didn't, alcohol was no longer a solution in my life. It was no longer a, uh, existent. And I remember thinking about that. I'm like, wait a second. And I'm delivered from alcohol. I think he finally answered me. And, um, I felt amazing. And I, I felt like the, the, there was this dark piece of something in my soul or a piece missing, if you will. And it just got filled back up. So I no longer needed to fill that with alcohol or something. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was when he prayed or when she had a word of knowledge over me and prayed over me at a distance telling me about stuff. Like, I don't know what it was. All I know is that day, literally, I was free. Like, I know this sounds dramatic and people might not even believe this, but, it, you know, oh, that ain't no, that's just weird. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I, I have many witnesses in my life including Cheyenne and my parents and my sister and so many people that knew the amount of anger and me drinking, seeing all the bottles and stuff I'd bag up and literally, and I have not touched not one little tiny drop of alcohol since that day. Nothing. People brought it around me. Someone tried to gift it to me that, well, you know, they didn't know, you know, uh, people, a lot of people didn't know. They still thought I drank. I'm like, I'm done. They're like, Oh, you finally quit. I'm like, I didn't quit actually. And I'm like, funny thing here. I got to tell you a story. I gave God 100% glory and I still to, do to this day. So if anybody says, oh, Scott quit drinking. No, I didn't quit drinking. God delivered me from drinking. He literally it freed me from the chains of alcoholism. Like I didn't do anything. Uh, I couldn't do it. I've tried a million times. Like I'm literally about to cry right now. Oh, don't do it, man. <clears throat> don't do it. So anyway... <laughs> There's nothing wrong with crying. But anyway, there's, uh, it, ever since that day, man, there's just no way I can take credit for it. There's no, there's no doubt. Uh, the, anything anybody tried to do to make me feel better, uh, pastors offered things, you know, maybe get some accountability and start living for God more and we'll watch you and maybe that'll help. That wouldn't help. That didn't help. People laying hands on me didn't help. Reading the Bible didn't help. Me trying to replace the addiction didn't help. Nothing. It was just gone well, by the time he uh, he answered my prayer. So I, I really am happy I got to explain this. Anybody who watched this all the way through, thank you. I know that it was a lot for just a little you know, end point there, but I'm telling you, I struggled with this. And uh, you know, I, st I really stayed in prayer a lot, even when I didn't get an answer. I did almost give up, but one last time, and that's when God answered me. And I was humble. And I'm not saying that we all need to, like, always get down and and cry and, and plead and beg and beg. I'm not saying that. Sometimes you do. Sometimes it's a matter of just demanding something. Like, there's a lot of different answers to prayer or reasons why God answers prayer. Uh, me, I didn't see the bigger picture. 
just like anybody, I wanted it when I wanted it. I wanted him to take it because he didn't give me what I wanted. I started believing that he wasn't real. So this is kind of a, a big learning experience. I still struggle with those things, but I always remember that, uh, you know, he did answer me. It just wasn't the exact moment that I wanted him to answer me, you know, and uh, I thank him so much for it because I haven't had a drink since. And thank God my son does not have to grow up around that. Even though I wasn't a bad drinker, it was just I don't want that, uh, you know. So if it wasn't for God, I would I would be I would probably be that dad. And um, so thank God for God <laughs> for who he is, you know. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, like I said, again, I'll say it, I wasn't like a horrible, like a, an abusive alcoholic or nothing, but drinking all the time. Like, what if someone needed to go to the hospital? I'm like the only driver. I'm the one who has the car. Cheyenne doesn't have her license and right now, and I'm the one who, who drives. What if something happened in an emergency? I was being so irresponsible. What if I needed to take my son? What if he fell and bumped his head and I needed to take him to the hospital and I'm drunk? Like, and then we get, into, I get pulled over and have to deal with all that and endangering the life of a child and her and also a DWI get my license taken away what if I got into an accident it's like you know so there's a lot of reasons why I didn't want to drink but no matter what I did I couldn't just man up and get rid of it because I had this selfish need to fill some empty piece in in my soul and in my mind so I chose to drink you know it might have turned around a little bit because I didn't see my son yet. She was like nine months pregnant or something or eight months pregnant at the time I got delivered. But still, I did take it very seriously. And no matter what I did, though, I was like scared of the addiction. Like it always came back because I had this this need to fill something and drinking is what did it. Now, God filled that up for me. And I still, you know, I have struggles. I still sin here and there, and I'm not. I'm never going to be perfect, and I'm still building my knowledge and uh, my relationship with God. So, if anybody, by the way, just to close this up, if anybody does not believe in God, um, I'm not shaming you. I understand, but like, give them a try, you know, and don't just try once. There's a lot of things that we don't know, and once you start to understand, and there's other people that can help you, listen to them. Just because you pray even 10 times or 100 times in a row, you know, doesn't mean God's not going to answer you or doesn't maybe he did answer you or maybe it's a prayer that's so selfish that he's like, you know, or, or something like that. He only answers things that are of his will, you know. So, uh, you know, if you're trying to get some job or something and God doesn't want you there because He's he knows you better than you know yourself and you're mad at him because he never got you the job you thought you wanted, Something like that, you know, so, or whatever. He's like, no, I have bigger plans for you. If you want that job, you got to get it. I'm only helping you out with what my will is for you, you know. I didn't understand that at the time. But he did answer me. God is good and God is faithful. And also anybody that's on here thinking, oh, Scott's now one of those Jesus freaks. In a way, yes, I am. But at, at the same time, I'm still me. I'm still cool. I'm not judgmental. <laughs> I can still be fun. I just don't drink. You see what I'm saying? I don't do that. And I'm trying to gain and build. And God has helped me a lot. And there's, I'm sure there's a lot more, a lot more that he's going to do that I have not even thought or imagined. And that's actually in the Bible. So... Give them a shot. If anybody has any questions, maybe you struggle with something and you want to ask me a question, I'd be happy to help you and try to talk to you when I have time. I'm, I work a lot and I'm very busy and I have a lot of commitments uh, outside of work too, but um, maybe I can guide you in the direction of somebody that's really good at, at answering questions about whatever you're questioning. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry it's about been about an hour, but I felt like all those things, I wanted everybody to get a good visual of, of my life and kind of how harsh that addiction really had a hold of me and how good God is by taking it away in a split second and never letting it come back. And I believe that I'm never going to have a drink again. That's a promise because I know God now and I know that there's no way... There's no way that he's going to let that happen. And there's no way that I'm going to let it happen because I'm free of it. Why would I like no matter what I go through, by the way, good or bad, I have not craved a drink once. This pandemic hit, I lost 
two jobs that I had. I had two jobs, lost them. Wasn't getting my unemployment. I did for a little bit, finally at some point, but um, now I have two jobs again, and one of them is way, way better. And, uh, you know, God has blessed us. But anyway, no matter what, I was in a bad, scared position, or I was having a, you know, a good time, maybe hung out with some people, never once wanted to drink, not once. Not, no craving. It's actually disgusting. I'm like, oh, why would you? You know, <laughs> but that freedom is something on another level, man. It's not, it wasn't a decision. It was like, uh, it was the power of God. It was the goodness of God, the love of God that did it. And um, I'm telling you, it, it really was amazing. And it still amazes me. I still thank him for it every now and then. I'm like, you know what? Thank you so much for that still. this It's just unbelievable. But, um, I love you guys, and uh, thank you so much for listening. And, uh, yeah, I've been wanting to share this for a long time. And I figured, I talked to my one pastor, and he was like, do it, do it, do it. Just just share it. Who cares? And I was like, well, it keeps going like 40 minutes. He's like, so people will watch 30, 40, 50-minute videos. <laughs> I was like, true, yeah. So I finally had some time. I figured, uh, you know, I keep talking. It's going to be an hour here. So I'm going to shut it off, but God bless everybody. And uh, I'm going to do more videos at some point too. Uh, so take care.